This is a video in Clinical Medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. This video demonstrates the placement of intraosseous catheters in children, reviewing indications, contraindications, placement techniques, and potential complications. We will demonstrate manual insertion as well as the use of power-assisted devices. Intraosseous access provides a rapid and reliable means for delivery of medications, crystalloid fluids, blood, and colloid products during pediatric resuscitation. In addition, when intraosseous access is achieved, blood samples can be obtained for laboratory analysis. Numerous studies show that an intraosseous catheter can be placed more rapidly than a central venous catheter, and that this technique is more reliable than venous cutdown. With the introduction and availability of power-assisted devices, which greatly facilitate intraosseous placement, guidelines now support the use of intraosseous access in patients of all ages. Intraosseous administration of fluid and medications is possible since there are connections between the marrow cavity within bones and the systemic venous circulation. The cortex overlying the metaphysis of long bones is relatively thin and easy to penetrate. The underlying cancellous bone drains through venous sinusoids into nutrient vessels and emissary veins into the systemic venous circulation. Cannulation anywhere within the non-collapsible medullary cavity provides a reliable means of infusing medications or fluids into the systemic venous circulation. Intraosseous cannulation is indicated when peripheral vascular access cannot be rapidly obtained in any critically ill infant or child, including those in shock, respiratory failure, or respiratory or cardiac arrest. Intraosseous access should not be attempted in any bone with a suspected or known fracture or proximal to a site or in a bone in which a previous attempt was unsuccessful. Indwelling hardware from a previous orthopedic procedure may prevent successful cannulation in that bone. The presence of skin or soft tissue infection is a relative contraindication. Avoid intraosseous cannulation in patients with underlying bone diseases, such as osteogenesis imperfecta or osteopenia, in whose bones may not tolerate or support cannulation, and in patients with osteopetrosis a condition with very dense bone in which cortical penetration may not be possible. Several anatomic sites may be used for intraosseous cannulation. The most commonly used include the proximal tibia, the distal tibia, the proximal humerus, and the distal femur. The anterior iliac spine is used less commonly. The sternum and distal radius have been identified for use in adults, but not children. We will review anatomic landmarks at the most commonly used sites before demonstrating preparation and cannula insertion. The proximal tibia is the preferred site in children since palpation and identification of underlying bony landmarks is less likely to be obscured by large amounts of soft tissue. In addition, this location is remote from the head and chest where airway management and chest compressions may be ongoing in an emergency situation. Slight external rotation of the leg and placing a towel roll under the popliteal fossa may be helpful to flex the knee and maintain stability of the leg. Identify the lower pole of the patella. The prominence immediately below it is the tibial tuberosity. One to two centimeters inferior and medial to the tuberosity is a broad, flat surface of tibia that serves as the targeted insertion site. The distal tibia has easily palpable landmarks in most patients. It has less cortical thickening than the proximal tibia, so it is preferred in older children. Place the hip in a frog leg position to expose the distal tibia. Identify the medial malleolus. The intraosseous insertion site spans the flat portion of the tibia, one to two centimeters proximal to the superior margin of the malleolus. When tibial sites are not available or when previous attempts have been unsuccessful, the proximal humerus can be used for intraosseous cannulation. With the patient in the supine position, rest the ipsilateral elbow alongside the torso. Because the overlying deltoid muscle can make identification of landmarks challenging, begin by palpating the mid portion of the humerus in the upper arm. Follow the bone proximally until the greater tubercle is appreciated. 
just anterior to the midline of the lateral shoulder and distal to the shoulder joint. This bony prominence is the insertion site. The distal femur can be cannulated for intraosseous infusion, though abundant overlying soft tissue and muscle often make identification of bony landmarks challenging. Therefore, this site should be considered when the use of tibial and humeral sites is contraindicated. To relax the quadriceps, flex the hip and knee slightly with a towel roll. The distal femoral insertion site is in the midline, just 1 to 3 centimeters proximal to the palpable epicondyles of the distal femur. Manual needles designed specifically for intraosseous access are available for use in children of all ages. These needles have cutting stylets to prevent soft tissue or bony spicules from obstructing the cannula, ergonomic handles to facilitate placement, and depth markings or an adjustable flange to guide depth of insertion. Large bore spinal and butterfly needles may be used in infants if an intraosseous needle is not available. Power-assisted devices have been shown to improve placement time and success rates for intraosseous cannulation. Currently, two such devices are approved for pediatric use. A spring-loaded device allows the single deployment of a needle to a preset depth of insertion, which is calculated based on the patient's age. A drill-assisted device allows placement of either a pediatric or adult-length needle. The battery-powered driver and cutting needle facilitate penetration of the bony cortex, while the operator can control the depth of insertion by increasing or decreasing the pressure applied and by changing the length of time the drill trigger is depressed. Place all equipment on an open surface that is readily accessible. Make sure that approved biohazard sharps receptacles are nearby since intraosseous cannulas are not equipped with retractable safety needles. Follow standard precautions. Wash your hands prior to any contact with the patient. Whenever possible, identify the patient using two identifiers, such as name and date of birth, before beginning the procedure and whenever a procedural timeout is initiated. Explain the procedure to the conscious patient and to any family members who are present. Position the patient so that the selected insertion site is easily accessible. Wear protective eyewear and sterile gloves. Using a septic technique, clean the chosen insertion site with either chlorhexidine or povidone iodine solution. In awake and alert patients, infiltrate the area with lidocaine to provide local anesthesia. When using manual insertion, remove the safety cap from the needle. Ensure that the stylet is appropriately placed within the needle and that the bevels are aligned. Using your non-dominant hand, stabilize the limb distal to the insertion site. This allows for counterpressure against the advancing needle and prevents unexpected patient movement. Make sure that no portion of your hand is behind the insertion site to decrease the risk of needle stick injury. Place the needle handle in the palm of your dominant hand. Place your thumb and forefinger along the shaft of the needle for stabilization. Place the needle against the skin overlying the site. Puncture the skin and continue through the soft tissue. Use firm, steady pressure and a rotating or coring motion to penetrate the bony cortex. You will note a sudden give with the loss of resistance as you enter the medullary cavity. Remove the needle cap and stylet. If the device has a supporting flange, adjust it so the surface is flush with the skin to stabilize the needle and to avoid inadvertent deeper insertion. Take care to avoid disrupting the needle while adjusting the flange. For power assisted insertion, we will demonstrate use of the drill device. Select the appropriate needle size based on the patient's weight. The pediatric needle is designed for use in children weighing less than 40 kilograms, unless large amounts of overlying soft tissue predict the need for a longer needle. Remove the needle from its protective container. Attach the needle set to the driver, allowing the magnetic pull to hold it in place. Turn the safety cap clockwise to remove it. Pull it off the needle. Place the needle against the skin overlying the site, one to two centimeters from the adjacent physis. Apply gentle, steady pressure while engaging the trigger 
to allow the needle to penetrate the soft tissue and then the bony cortex. Once resistance decreases, marking the entrance into the medullary cavity, take care to release the trigger and allow the driver to stop spinning before pulling back or disconnecting the needle. Gently hold the needle and pull the drill directly backward and off the needle to disconnect. Turn the stylet counterclockwise to unscrew it and gently remove it from the needle set. A number of methods can be used to confirm catheter placement. First, the needle should stand on its own because of the lateral support of the bony cortex. Aspiration of marrow contents also signifies that the catheter is likely to be in the appropriate cavity. However, it is important to note that absence of blood return can occur even in a properly placed intraosseous catheter. Absence of local swelling at the insertion site with infusion also indicates correct placement. It is normal to sense resistance during the manual infusion into the intraosseous cannula as the bone marrow cavity is not distensible. A syringe can be attached directly to the needle hub. Alternatively, attach extension tubing to the needle hub to avoid further needle movement. Use wide bore tubing when available. The marrow specimen you obtain on aspiration can be used for bedside glucose testing and sent for culture, blood type, drug levels, electrolyte concentrations, and pH and PCO2. Samples should not be used for analysis of complete blood count. Samples should not be sent for laboratory analysis after more than five minutes of resuscitation if medications or fluids have been previously infused. A 10 cc saline flush is recommended initially to open venous sinusoids as well as after the infusion of any medications. In conscious children, pretreatment with lidocaine at a dose of 0.5 mg per kilogram through the intraosseous catheter can be effective in preventing visceral pain resulting from the increased intramedullary pressure. When a rapid infusion rate is crucial, a bolus infused manually with syringes is the most efficient way to quickly deliver a considerable volume of fluid. Pressure bags and infusion pumps may also be used. You may place tape or sterile gauze around the insertion site. However, avoid the use of dressings that will prevent you from monitoring for infiltration, infection, or limb swelling. Use an armboard to provide additional stabilization. Secure the IV tubing away from the insertion site to avoid inadvertent movement of the catheter. Record the time and date of placement near the insertion site or on an identifying wristband. The intraosseous catheter should be removed as soon as more definitive access is obtained. To remove an intraosseous needle, loosen and remove any tape or dressing securing the cannula and extension tubing from the skin. Stabilize the extremity. Firmly grasp the needle flange or connect a sterile lure lock syringe to the hub. Rotate the syringe and catheter clockwise while gently pulling the needle from the extremity. Place a sterile occlusive dressing over the insertion site. Serious complications associated with intraosseous cannulation are rare. Extravasation can occur following inadvertent infusion of fluid into the soft tissue surrounding the targeted bone or beneath the periosteum. Prolonged extravasation can lead to compartment syndrome. To decrease this risk, perform serial examinations for swelling and remove intraosseous catheters once further vascular access is obtained, ideally within 24 hours. Introduction of skin flora or other pathogens can lead to infection at the insertion site, within the soft tissue, or in the bone. Using proper aseptic technique and limiting the time the intraosseous catheter is in place can minimize this risk. Prophylactic antibiotic therapy is not routinely recommended. Although not reported in the pediatric literature, growth plate injuries can occur if an intraosseous catheter is inadvertently directed into a physis. Substantial force may be required to penetrate the bony cortex, particularly when using manual placement technique. Fractures can occur, especially in young infants or patients with osteopenia. Microscopic fat emboli have been detected in animal studies. However, pediatric case series have not reported adverse outcomes related to embolic events. Appropriate placement of an intraosseous catheter is a reliable means of obtaining urgent vascular access in children, with low rates of reported complications. Both manual and power-assisted placement techniques can be used to deliver fluids and medications rapidly during pediatric resuscitation.